So good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, Ontario Northland Passenger Rail Vision. Our guest speaker this morning will be Karina Moore, CEO of Ontario Northland. My name is Terry Johnson, and I'm the president of Transport Action Canada, which is Canada's national advocacy group for sustainable and inclusive public transport. We're hosting this event today together with our affiliate organization, the Northeastern Ontario Rail Network. Today, Karina Moore will be discussing the recently published initial business case for Northeastern Passenger Rail Service. But we now have this document and the funding provided in Ontario Budget 2021 to continue the process to restoring the train, which arises from the promise by Premier Doug Ford at the last election to restore this service, is largely due to the efforts of many citizens and volunteers. Therefore, I'm going to start this morning's event by introducing the groups that have been involved in the campaign to bring back the Northlander train. Transport Action Canada was founded in 1976 to promote sustainable public transport for all Canadians and be a voice for the passenger of the new, then newly created Via Rail. Our advocacy and public policy research covers rail, bus and remote air services to connect Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Through our network of regional chapters and affiliate organizations, we also represent transit passengers in cities and towns across Canada. We were originally called Transport 2000 Canada but the millennium has come and gone. Many Canadians still don't have access to reliable public transport. And since the cuts to Via Rail in the 80s and 90s, Canadians have watched the rest of the world invest while we stand apart. Too many Canadians have seen public transport linked to the or lost entirely. And as advocates, we do seem to spend a lot of time fighting such cuts. Too often, public transport suffers when government tightens their purse strings. It's a false economy. Transport poverty leads to physical poverty increased living costs, loss of jobs, social exclusion, increased physical risks. Cuts lead to less livable and attractive communities, both for people and businesses, and in the end that costs our economy far more as well. Public transport is not a single issue, standing apart from other challenges and concerns we face in our daily lives as communities and as a country. It's the means to achieving our goals and empowering people to overcome many challenges. Buses and trains connect us to each other, to visit relatives, to medical appointments, to groceries, school, college, work, business and more besides. And when we take public transport, we also gain back our time rather than having to keep our, keep our eyes on the road for hours and hours. That's if we do have a choice and many Canadians don't. Having access to dependable and affordable transportation is freedom and investing in better public transport makes our communities more connected, inclusive and sustainably productive. Over the past year and a half, it's also been made clear just how critical public transport is to public to frontline workers, our nurses, our doctors, and even the people keeping our grocery store shelves full. We know we also know that for many Canadians, having access to reliable public transport is about building survivable communities. Today, each of us is joining this meeting from the traditional territories of one of the many First Nations that have inhabited this land before the colonial era, before the building of the railways, before Confederation. So I want to acknowledge the traditional territories that apply to the route the Northland the train once crossed, and hopefully soon will cross again. In Toronto, we acknowledge the ancestral traditional territories of the Ojibwe, Ashinaabe, and in particular the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. In Simcoe and Muskoka, also the tr traditional territory of the Ashinaabe, and specifically the Ojibwe and Chippewa peoples. This territory is covered by the Lake Simcoe Treaty 16. North Bay is situated in the traditional territory of the Nipissing First Nation, also Ashinaabe, and this region is covered by the Robinson Huron and Upper Canada Treaties. To the north in Timmins and Cochrane, both are in Treaty 9 territory, and this is a traditional land of the Ojibwe Chippewa, Oji Cree, Algonquin, Muskegon and Moose Cree. Today, as we and our governments and institutions commit to working in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with Indigenous peoples across Canada, the railway, once a tool of settlement, has a vital role to play, building transportation solutions together that are inclusive and allow everyone to travel, confident in their personal safety, is deeply woven into the process of building a better future. If we, each of us, not just leaving our polit politicians, commit to addressing the call to action to provide safe transportation to everybody in Canada, we'll be creating a system that supports all communities and everyone will benefit from it. But if we don't, the disadvantages faced by many Canadians because of discrimination, both historical ongoing, or because of disability or poverty, will remain entrenched. 
the fulfillment of so many of the rights that we as Canadians should be able to take for granted, like education, healthcare, social contact and inclusion, gainful employment, even access to affordable food, are all contingent on being able to get someplace, or much easier for our communities to provide if we can reliably get around. So providing dependable mobility is a responsibility that our government should fulfill. And Transport Action's role is to hold our politicians accountable for that responsibility. And at the same time, to advance recommendations that allow public transportation to be provided effectively, inclusively, and reliably. We need to connect municipal, provincial, federal, and private sector services into a cohesive system that puts the passenger front and center. And above all, Canada needs to start doing this now, using the tools and technologies to hand, rather than advancing visions of mega projects that always seem to get studied years ahead and shelved. Now, like many Northerners often, often do, um, Lucille Firth, who is the co-chair of the Northeastern Ontario Rail Network, has to be in Toronto this morning. Therefore, she is not able to join us to speak live to introduce her campaign, but she is going to be with us to listen in if possible. Lucille is also a member of the board, Transport Actions, Ontario Chapter, and her tireless work has been crucial in getting the campaign thus far, and an inspiration to passenger rail campaigns in other regions of Canada. So what I'm going to do now is to try to play a short video that we recorded yesterday. Transportation in Northeastern Ontario is not the same as transportation in Southern Ontario. We don't have um, places to detour vehicles off highways. We have interesting weather conditions year round. We have limited population, but 90% of the geography of Ontario is Northern Ontario. So we do have some interesting needs that are different from the rest of Ontario. But that doesn't mean that the people in Northeastern Ontario don't deserve good transportation network. And that means an integrated bus passenger train network that will connect the North and the South and the East and the West. We need visitors to come to Northeastern Ontario. We need tourism opportunities. And at the same time, we need to have the residents have access to a method of transportation year round without interruption of weather or road conditions, but transportation will get them to their appointments, the students to their universities, the families to connect with their families in the other parts of Canada, and businesses to thrive more than anything else. And Northern, Northeastern Ontario has tourism opportunities galore that cannot be accessed at the moment. And speaking of tourism opportunities, the second biggest attraction in Ontario, next to Niagara Falls, is Algonquin Park. In 2012, the government of the day decided to sell Ontario Northland and they canceled the train that took people to and from appointments, to and from their family, to and from their universities, to and from the businesses and the, the tourism attractions in Northern Ontario. The people of the North decided that they were going to speak up. So in 2013, a group of people from Northeastern Ontario decided that the cancellation of the train in 2012 was not providing transportation service for the North that was so desperately needed and something had to be done about it. This group turned into the Northeastern Ontario Rail Network, an advocacy group, which now is proud to say, we have the support of 2,300 individuals. We have formal council resolutions to support passenger rail from every municipality north of Washago to Moosonee. We have a government who has committed to providing passenger rail service. We have funding to proceed with the expansion of the um, business case that was provided, uh, created by the um, Ontario Northland and the Ministry of Transportation through Metrolinx. Ontario Northland was mandated to provide passenger rail services from North Bay to Moosonee and then on uh, through Cochrane to Moosonee. And the reality of it is 
there was a missed marketing opportunity in the Muskoka area. We just happened to be um, passengers who got on and off the train in that area, south of North Bay. Their mandate was from North Bay to Cochrane. And as a result, the marketing was missing from the Muskoka area. Now with the COVID situation, with so many people traveling north and, and actually having moved up north, uh, and the convenience of the uh, telecommunications that we have, we have an opportunity here to heavily market the uh, Muskoka region, um, Perry Sound region up to North Bay, and basically let people know that they could take the train. So I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to bring people to Northern Ontario through Muskoka up to the uh, um, wonders of Northern Ontario and uh, in the near, very, very near future. I would like to thank all those who supported us over the last eight and a half years and hopefully will continue to support us till we can put bums in seats on the train. And I look forward to having you ride with us on the passenger train from Toronto up to Cochrane and further on to Moosonee. The reality of it is I will be happy to sell you a ticket. Ontario Northland would be happy to sell you a ticket. We look forward to having you join us. Please follow us on neorn.ca and Keep on keeping on with the support. Thank you. Personally, I'm really looking forward to Lauren riding the North Thunder again too. I had hoped to bring my family on holiday to Northern Ontario by train back in 2013. And losing the opportunity to do so was one of the reasons I decided to get involved in transport action. With a bit of luck, it will be possible to make that trip before my kids finish university and head off on their own adventures. Um, but with the timeline pushed out to the mid 2020s in the initial business case, it's going to be a squeaker. To introduce our guest speaker this morning, I'd like to welcome another leader in transport advocacy for Northern Ontario, Dr. Linda Savory Gordon, a director of the Coalition for Algoma Passenger Trains. You will also uh, say a few words about that campaign. Hello, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be with you all, and especially since we all share this passion for um, for good transportation in Northern Ontario, particularly in our case, it's um, as, as Lucille. Uh, mentioned it's it's rail. Uh, we have vast distances to travel and so um, both, both from a point of view of accessibility and comfort and um, and safety, rail over those vast distances is, makes so much more sense. Uh, unfortunately we we just don't have <laughs> very much of it at all in Northern Ontario. I'm just going to talk very very uh, briefly about um, what Lucille sometimes calls our two bookends to um, the network which we would like to see uh, in the future of using the old rail beds. Um, one bookend is the former Northlander route and on the, the west side is the Bear Train uh, route between uh, Sault Ste. Marie and Hearst. We're working very hard on that through the Masqua Transportation Association Incorporated under the leadership of Missinabi Cree First Nation. The passenger service on this line unfortunately was cancelled in 2015. Mark Garneau, the minister of, uh, it was a federally funded service and Mark Garneau has through the whole time that he was minister uh, refused to uh, even consider restoring the subsidy for that line. Uh, meanwhile, the new minister has, in our letters to him, seems to have cut and pasted the very same message that Mark Garneau had in his letters. So it's very discouraging. So we're, we're trying to find funding through private foundations in order to just even get uh, one train a week going just so that we can get things started again and while well, we're continuing to lobby uh, the governments to uh, provide the uh, the funding. So that's just, uh, as I say, the, the Western uh, bookend, but ideally we'd love to see Ontario Northland do the whole loop um, going along Highway 11 route and Highway 17 route as well between the two bookends. Karina Moore joined Ontario Northland in 2005, bringing her international experience to the role of Director of Telecommunications a graduate of Waterloo University in Systems Design, Engineering, and Business Administration and Management, she was promoted to Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of the Refurbishment Division in 2010, where she directed 
several external remanufacturing contracts and led labor negotiations with the ONTC's five union groups. Upon appointment as CEO of Ontario Northland in the fall of 2014, Karina Moore became the first female CEO of any Canadian railway, as well as the first woman to serve as CEO of Ontario Northland since its inception in 1902. In 2018, Karina was named Outstanding Woman of the Year by her peers in the rail industry. This accolade is jointly given by the League of Railway Women and industry publication, Progressive Railroading. She was selected also by Railway Age magazine as one of 10 women who are visionaries in the rail industry in North America, also becoming the first woman to appear on the front cover of Railway Age since its inception in 1856. Karina Moore is also a member of the Railway Association of Canada Board of Directors and was the first woman to be appointed to the RAC board since its inception in 1917. That these milestones occurred only in the second decade of the 21st century speaks to how durable the glass ceiling has been in the rail industry and the achievement it represents to have finally brought it down. Karina Moore, was also appointed as Honorary Colonel of the 21st Aerospace Control and Warning Squadron, an RCAF unit based at CFB North Bay in May 2020. As President and CEO of Ontario Northland, Karina Moore has led a team that has secured new and diverse rail freight customers, expanded motor coach services, and gain confidence and long-term investment from the province of Ontario. Her current focus on improving public transportation services in Northern Ontario, ensuring seamless connections between communities, hospitals, and educational institutions is the subject of our webinar today. In addition to all her accomplishments, Karina has a remarkable ability to be accessible and responsible responsive rather to the grassroots and I can vouch for that. Rather than delegating participation in community forums and conferences to other Ontario Northland staff, she often attends herself. She is always such a pleasure to talk to uh, at meetings all over Northern Ontario. She shows over and over again that she listens to the people of Northern Ontario is open to their express transportation needs and acts on those expressions. How fortunate Northern Ontario is to have you at the head of our public transportation agency, Karina. Thank you so much for conducting this webinar for Transport Action today. Thank you, Linda. Let's get to the presentation and get to why I think everybody is here today. Um, and, and thank you so much, Terry, for inviting me to present on a topic, obviously, that is near and dear to um, Ontario Northland. And um, obviously, I, I did want to spend some time when we get started um, providing an update on Ontario Northland, and then we'll, we'll head into the update on passenger rail, which I know um, is everybody's main focus for today's conversation. But just when we're talking about transportation, I think it, um, you know, it's meaningful to look at where Ontario Northland has come in the last six years. Obviously, after being a transportation agency since 1902, we've been through um, different uh, opportunities to expand. And really what our focus has been is how do we do more for the North in transportation? Because as you said, Terry, there is, um, you know, little to no to very few options for Northerners when you get north of Barrie. Uh, to connect to people. And especially when you get sort of north of the Huntsville area, there's limited to no options. So we're, we're thrilled to be able to put up this new map and just to share with you our focus when we started this transformation of Ontario Northland was to say, let's get back to what our mandate is. Our mandate is to develop and make sure that the North is prosperous. And how are we gonna do that? We're going to, within our authority, um, provide um, business cases to government for decision making that would allow the expansion of services both on the rail um, freight side and you'll see on this map um, we have transload facilities where the, the red dots are on the rail line 
Uh, so our rail line, 700 miles of track, we're the largest short line in Canada. And we go from North Bay all the way up to Hearst, over to Calstock, Ruin, Aranda, and then up to Moosonee. And part of our focus is, uh, and I see some of the Northern mayors on here, which is wonderful because we've been partnering with them to see how we can get off rail customers onto the rail line. So uh, the farmers, uh, agriculture, lumber, uh, propane, how do we get those uh, trucks off the road? Partner with the trucking uh, industry for last mile services on the rail side. Uh, we also, as you saw from the last map to this map, the white network is our bus service. And this is something that, you know, the North deserves. There's no question about it. We see lots of people, both um, seniors who have a car or don't and don't want to um, drive in the inclement weather, weather and geography of Northern Ontario. We also see uh, many students and also younger people that are very environmentally conscious who want to either take a bus or a train. And so in the last four or five years, we've expanded from Ottawa all the way to Winnipeg, Winnipeg being last year during the pandemic when Greyhound exited the north, we picked up uh, a number of those gaps right away. So in terms of the immediate impact of Greyhound's announcement a few weeks ago, uh, there really isn't any to, to Ontario Northland because we saw that exit a year ago when COVID started. So, uh, and part of our, our focus has been our major ridership is seniors and students. So let's make it easy for them door to door. Let's make sure that they can connect to their college or university and we attract students to the North and let's make sure people can get to their medical appointments in a very reliable and safe way. And let's stop at all of the, um, all the hospitals in Northern Ontario. And so you'll see, and we just added CHEO to the list as well as uh, the hospital in Winnipeg. And so we're always, I'm always interested in doing these types of conversations because it always leads to another thought or idea on how we can do more for transportation in Northern Ontario, and certainly how we can seamlessly integrate services, both on the municipal side, as well as private shuttles or private carriers to allow a very seamlessly integrated service from the North to major centers in Toronto and or Ottawa. Uh, the other part you'll see on this is a remanufacturing center. So we do, you know, one of the things that we continue to look at is we have an unbelievable skill set internally um, with our skilled trades and we've been fixing and, and remanufacturing trains and, and locomotives for 100 years. And now we've gone to the external market and we attract uh, rail assets from across North America uh, with the outstanding skill set that we have internally. So lots of stuff going on. And obviously I'm proud to, I would be remiss without putting this slide in and how we've reacted to COVID. You will see reduced seating capacity, mandatory face coverings. We do a screening on our Polar Bear Express with um, temperature checks. Um, and we haven't had any uh, COVID that has been as part of our uh, organization. So we have reacted quickly. We have compassionate employees who want to make sure that when you travel with us, you're safe and we're going to be a reliable source of transportation. So, you know, we just take it a step further. If we look at motor coach and some of the things I know that Terry has been involved with on the on the bus side, what our focus will be in the next year and going forward is how do we align passenger volumes with services? There are still gaps, um, gaps that we didn't use to provide that we are going to look at in Northern Ontario and a little bit farther south of North Bay where there are also gaps. And our role is to say to the government, uh, you know, these cities don't have, and communities and small rural, they don't have connectivity. They don't have any other options. And so how are we going to both connect those communities to the major centers, but also set up a network that connects to the rail line so that when we progress and hopefully we do to a passenger service that connects Toronto to the north, we'll also have feeder bus service that are seamlessly integrated with that passenger rail network. So we'll do that on the bus side, uh, continue to work with other carriers in other provinces so that there can be a country service that goes from one side of the country, east to west and west to east. Um, which obviously we no longer have with Greyhound, but there's certainly a, a number of providers that we're working with to make that seamless integration. On the rail freight side, um, you know, we must continue to attract industry and business to the North. That's what the North needs. And we need to be able to show them that we have a reliable transportation network. And this is, this is fulsome of bus, it's fulsome of rail a passenger and, and rail freight. So you attract industry, but you also attract families. You attract families to the North who are looking for services and they're looking for bus services 
and they're looking for rail services. These are things that they're used to in the city centers and that we should certainly look to provide because especially with what we're seeing with COVID, lots of people realizing that they wanna get out of the urban centers and move to the North and how can we connect those people better? So on the passenger rail side, we're gonna to continue to provide essential services between Cochrane and Moosonee with our Polar Bear Express. We just introduced a fully new consist uh, on that train that we refurbished in North Bay with our skilled trades uh, capabilities. And it's just anybody who hasn't taken that train, man, I would, I would suggest that you come up to Cochrane, stay at our Cochrane Station Boutique Hotel and take the train up to Moosonee. It's an absolutely beautiful part of our country that I think a lot of people don't, don't realize. So that'll be on the list for people. We're looking at Ontario staycations and how we keep people in the province. Um, and of course, the Northern Passenger Rail updated business case. And I'm gonna set, spend a few slides on that. Uh, remanufacturing repair, that's about optimizing our skill set and the investment that we've made. We have a phenomenal relationship with our union in there who's doing great work to um, continue with the highest level of quality. We attract business literally from across the country to our paint shop because of the quality into our locomotive and into our passenger shop. We have a, a strategic alliance with Metrolinx to do go-cars. So a lot of really great stuff happening there. We have more business in the shops externally than we ever have in the history of Ontario Northland. And with every dollar of profit, it reduces the investment required to provide public transportation. And we all know, the people on this call know, public transportation is a cost, but it, I'd like to call it an investment. I know Lucille refers to it as an investment as well, and it is an investment. And the Northerners that we serve deserve that investment. And um, they deserve passenger rail as well. So we're gonna continue to do transportation planning uh, through ourselves into MTO, now the new ministry that we report to as of April uh, 2020. And we're also going to be talking, continuing to talk with the communities that we serve to understand what their transportation needs are and making sure that we're integrated and we, we understand and progress the right services for them. <clears throat> so uh, on to the, the meat of the presentation of what, what everybody wants to talk about, I think, today. So um, obviously, we are thrilled to have uh, the announcement finally that the the first part of the business planning uh, is done. So the initial business case is done. And what that looked at is what is this service going to be reimagined as? And this will not look like the old Northlander. It will be new equipment, modern, Wi-Fi enabled, fully accessible. Um, we are looking at um, state-of-the-art equipment as, as the North deserves as well, in my opinion. And we see lots of funding that goes to different areas of the province. And I, I'm really just really pleased uh, with um, our relationship with MTO and the confidence that they have in us and the understanding that they have in the impact of Northern transportation, including passenger rail. And they really do. I can tell you that the people that we work with at MTO have sincere um, understanding of the impact. And that's why we're progressing through this. And so just some highlights. So just to get everybody on the same page with the process. So the initial business case is something that's done that looks at a whole bunch of different options as the first step. And in that business case, if you've read it, um, it looked at a number of different options of connecting the North and the option number six, which is Toronto to Cochrane or Timmins was selected with 13 stops and recommendations on what that service would look like, how much it would cost, what the capital requirements are, what the operating requirements are. Um, but what this next part of the process um, does is dive in. So we, you know, we, we looked at it sort of in a vacuum, right? We didn't go and talk to all the communities. We know a lot about the North. We know a lot about what we think the communities need and want. Um, and we brought that information forward to MTO and Metrolinx when we were writing the initial business case together. We know that we need the schedule to be working for everyone. We need it to work for tourism coming into the North. We need it to work for medical appointments going into the South. We need it to work for business appointments. So certainly we all understand that the schedule that used to be is no longer and will not be again. We know what Northerners are saying about schedule and getting into downtown Toronto in the morning so that they can have an effective and valuable day. Uh, and leave the, the south in the early evening so that you can spend a day if you want without the cost of a hotel room or one hotel room will get you two full days in Toronto. 
So we, we, we message that as how do we get people and support those people that have long distances travel for medical appointments, uh, that want to come up north for tourism, which we all should celebrate uh, and, and attract people. And I know on one of the last calls I was on, there's some phenomenal things going on in terms of the, um, the packaging that people are thinking about to attract passengers to passenger rail. So when we move on to the update of business case and what the next year looks like, um, right now we're collaborating with Metrolinx. They have a ton of resources on business cases and business case writing uh, are used to a, a whole bunch of growth. So we're working closely with them. Um, we're going to uh, collaborate with CN. One of the things that we all recognize is that the on-time performance needs to be there to be an effective solution. And we didn't see that at the beginning of the Northlander, but we certainly saw that at the end of the Northlander with our positive relationship with CN. And I mean, we um, at all levels of our organization have a fantastic relationship with CN. We, we terminate with them in North Bay and Ruan Naranda and Hearst on the freight side. And so this is an extension of our partnership and there is understanding of the fact that we you know, we can't wait in a siding for hours and get people into downtown Toronto so that they can miss their medical appointment or miss um, their business meeting. There has to be some understanding there. So those discussions are taking place. Uh, we have completed a track audit on our um, network. So from North Bay North, we completed a track audit in March, both internally with our own resources, as well as through a third party that um, we've worked with on capital infrastructure in the past. Um, we are also looking at options for shelter design and locations. We recognize that we don't need a fulsome station at all these locations and the costs that are incurred by those stations. And so we are looking at a very safe um, and weather protected shelter that would be uh, at locations where there isn't current infrastructure. Uh, and we will be meeting with um, communities and First Nations partners, uh, municipalities, uh, over the next probably two or three months to sit down with them and understand what this passenger rail service means, what it looks like, what the risks are, what the opportunities are, and to put all of that down on paper so that we can represent what the North needs in this updated business case. Now, understand that our role as an agency is to do these business cases and to present them to government for decision making. And that's so the intent with the $5 million that we received this year is to complete uh, what you see up on the slide here for decision making next, so the end of this fiscal, which is March 2022. Um, and then the next step would be to gain approval for construction and procurement of all the items that we need, obviously passenger cars, uh, some shelters, uh, some track updates, um, and then look for the implementation of the service based on um, some of the critical path items of those. So obviously we're looking at various passenger car options, that will be a critical path item of how quickly we can get cars and, um, and presenting that as part of the updated business case. There, trying to keep it to the time allotment, Terry, and happy to um, get to the, the part where we get to questions from everyone. So thank you very much, Karina. I uh, really appreciate that presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, if anybody wants to ask a question, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And we should be able to, um, to take a couple of questions that have already come in. And so I have a question from John Shrubsall who says, when you look at improvements to the bus service, do you work with Via Rail to supplement or complement what they are doing? Would it make sense to connect bus service to via Northern, Ontario, Northern Quebec service to Sanitaire? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. There's, and we have a great relationship with VIA and um, actually just recently we'll be moving into their train station uh, for our bus network in Ottawa. And um, I think there's other opportunities that we can look at to integrate when you get to Toronto as well on the bus network and in future, uh, should we, move forward with passenger rail, but absolutely. I think, um, especially because VIA is federally funded and is part of government as well, that we should ourselves via um, Metrolinx and private carriers should work together to integrate our services. So what the vision is for me is, you know, we have online ticketing, you can go on, if you're someone who lives in a rural community in Northern Ontario, you should be able to get a destination, in my opinion, in future, if we're, if we're visioning. Uh, anywhere in Canada, 
and have a seamless ticket, the same way as you go onto an airline and you can get multiple carriers, but you get from point A to point B. And so uh, certainly we're in discussions with VIA both right now on the bus side, because we've had a lot of growth there and wanna make sure that our bus customers are integrated with their rail customers. Okay, ne next question, this comes from Paul Bennett. Are you considering a sleeping car service or are you thinking more along the lines of what CN used to call the day-nighter service? Um, so we've, we're, we're looking at everything. I, I think it's safe to say that, you know, the number one um, focus right now is how do we get a service up and running to serve the needs of the North? Um, but certainly when we look at the Northern component, whether it's from Cochrane or Timmins down, to North Bay, that part of the trip will be overnight because we've we've heard loud and clear from Northerners that they want to get into Toronto in the morning. So uh, we are we're looking at options there. Um, it, it might look like the day night service. Um, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful? And this is you know me visioning, but you know around the world we see some amazing solutions for uh, sleeper cars and those types of things. But step one is getting the service and getting people from the north connected to Toronto. Great, thank you. I'm going to take a question now um, that is from John Rye. And he says, have you had difficulty getting new services into Google Maps and Google Transit? Because he's noticed that it's taken other carriers quite a long time to, to get, that, get that process going as they've taken over Ridge from Greyhound. Okay, uh, so we've had some good success with Google Transit. Um, I would follow, I'll, I can follow up and, and get back to you if you'd like um, with the person that looks after our passenger services to see if there's been any recent issues, but in the past, it's been, it's been fairly good. Going to combine a couple of questions here. Um, a couple of people have asked this one as why 13 stops in the initial business case? Um, so for example, South River is right at the northern gate of Algonquin Park. Um, what, you know, what is the rationale behind the 13 stops that were, that were chosen in, in the initial business case? And is this something that will be looked at um, in the updated business case? Yes, um, this is absolutely something that's going to be looked at. Um, there was collaboration with MTO and, and Metrolinks on the initial business case of what um, uh, people thought might be the right solution. And um, our intent is to meet with those communities that had stops before that no longer uh, have them in the initial business case and talk to them about the impact. I was involved with a, another one of these last week. And, you know, I, in terms of South River, I, I went to high school in South River. I spent a lot of time traveling internationally, but certainly I spent a lot of time in the North. I grew up in the North. I uh, spent a lot of time in Algonquin Park. I understand the impact that the train and transportation has on those communities, especially as a midpoint between North Bay and Huntsville. And so, uh, the, you know, the updated business case is meant to dive into those types of things and look at what makes sense. Obviously, we have to also note the fact that the, one of the number one requests of passengers was to get from the north to the south quickly and efficiently. And so sometimes that means not stopping at all the locations because they don't make as much sense anymore, especially with our integrated and enhanced bus network where we can literally um, meet at the train and take someone uh, to their small community. So all of those things are going to be uh, looked at as part of the updated business case with our recommendation to MTO at the, at the end. Obviously they will make the final decision on that, uh, but rest assured that every community will be supported by train or bus or both. Great, thank you. So the another community question um, is, yeah, Sudbury is the largest centre in the north. I mean, obviously it is served by the Ontario Northern Bus. Um, Mary Allen asks why the train to Sudbury has not been is not uh, covered in the initial in the initial business case. Well, the initial business case was only to look at where the Northlander used to run. So that's, you know, that's the, the number one answer. I know that um, as we heard from Linda and from her group, uh, lots of advocacy for an expansion to passenger rail to service different parts of the North. There's obviously we have a rail line to Hearst. There's a rail line from Hearst down to Sault Ste. Marie. And then there's another rail line from Sault Ste. Marie to Sudbury and then to North Bay. And so um, you know, all of these things I assume will be looked at in the future, but our focus right now is the advocacy and representing what the Northerners have said that they want in terms of reinstatement of the, the old Northlander service. Great. And so there's a question here that a couple of people have, have asked, which is, um, 
how is this going to be promoted? You know, previously the Northlander, I, people felt the Northlander was not well promoted as a connection yeah. to to Muskoka's, to cottage country. Yeah. So, so what what will change about the the way the service is promoted and um, how it is connected to the the tourism opportunities of the North? Yeah, you know what? I 100% agree with what Lucille said at the beginning of this. That it wasn't marketed properly. It wasn't it wasn't marketed really at all for anything uh, south of North Bay. And even the marketing that we were doing north of North Bay was not sufficient. Uh, it wasn't for lack of, I think, internal people wanting it, but there wasn't a lot of funding that was given or appreciation for the impact of um, that tourism marketing. But it's it's completely different. So this plan will include significant amount of marketing across the system and you know that's one of the things that I'm excited about the most because I think we've just touched the service on what the ridership might look like and obviously in these business cases we sort of have to go on what the ridership looks like today and how it may be impacted by by COVID or by tourism and I would ask you know there's lots of people on this call that probably have really wonderful ideas on ways that we can increase tourism and I've heard a lot of uh, groups in, in the North, as well as in the South, who are bringing forward some phenomenal ideas of how they're marketing in Europe. I mean, it's, it's, it's no surprise that there are rail friends around the world that are waiting for a service like this. And so um, the marketing will be completely different. We have a phenomenal marketing team at Ontario Northland now that uh, you've seen a lot of bus marketing recently. Um, and I'm excited for what the marketing is gonna look like for this new service should be implemented. So I'm, I'm seeing even more comments and questions coming in mentioning South River um, and, and, and tourism. So it's really good to hear that we're, you know, you're really looking at the, these opportunities. Uh, Move to a more technical question now. This comes from Steve Bergeron. And he has said, uh, he's asking in the business, in the initial business case and in your presentation, you've talked about needing to acquire new cars. Um, but not about locomotives. Um, is this a is this, is there a sufficient locomotive fleet at the moment um, in Ontario Northland to cover this service expansion? And also, can you tell us a little bit about um, what kind of equipment you might be considering? I mean, obviously, if negotiations are ongoing, you can't tell us everything. Um, and have you looked at um, push pull equipment? Yes. So yes to everything uh, to, for, for a quick answer. But so, we, well, actually no to the fact that we don't have enough locomotives. So yes, I mentioned passenger cars. Um, it is easier to get um, and more timely to get locomotives than it is passenger cars. So when I was referring to the passenger cars, I see that more of a critical path and how quickly we can get those into service. Um, and yes, we have looked at the push pull and how efficiently we can get into Union Station and out of Union Station and how that all looks and certainly looking at that type of technology is the most efficient solution so those will be the things that we will be diving into with reaching out to all the providers to see what's out there. Now, certainly on the locomotive side, we could probably uh, rearrange some of the things that we're doing so that if that happened to be the critical path, which I don't expect it to be that we would be able to pull from our own fleet. Um, you know, but the good news is, is that we're doing so well on the rail freight side and sort of supporting so many new customers and bringing on transload business that um, lots of our fleet, all of our fleet right now uh, is in service. So, Excellent. And another question about equipment is, um, and this is more, more, speaks more to how the equipment would interact with the stations, is what is the status of platform height for level boarding? Um, because this is, you know, this is an issue that's, that's increasingly prominent as we become more aware of making sure that disabled people have equal access to, to the trains, everybody else. And um, you know, what is the status also of looking at the, the existing station buildings that exist in many communities up and down the, up and down the line? And people are asking here, uh, you know, will, will, these, will these station buildings be preserved? And you know, will, will, they, will they come back into Ontario Northland use? So uh, I think what I can tell you is that the stations that are currently being used for bus services in um, uh, potentially Cochrane, should that be the terminating point, um, Inglehart and North Bay, those are obviously up and running and will be continued to be uh, Ontario Northland uh, stations. Uh, for the other ones, we are going to meet with communities. We're going to look at different shelter options. Uh, I know that there's um, a number of stations south of North Bay that have done some work on them. Some of the other ones have been sold. So part of what we'd like to do as part of the community consultation is meet with um, the CAO, the economic development, the city planner, and look at what the current infrastructure looks like. 
uh, and see how we can collaborate with the community so that the community can bring forward ideas to uh, provide um, a reliable and safe place for people to park and, and to stay. So those decisions haven't been made what it'll um, eventually look like. Um, right now, it's really about those conversations and that will include looking at the platform. So. Um, what I do know is that we will um, support all accessibility needs. We're proud of the buses that we support, probably one of the only providers that have fully accessible washrooms um, and wheelchair tie downs. And certainly that will be at least one of our cars that will fully support accessibility and whatever those platform requirements need to be to support that. Okay, so actually, I actually heard something very interesting that I did not realize that you had fully fully accessible washrooms on the on the buses, and that's something yeah. that the Canadian Transportation Agency has recently flagged as, as something they're going to increasingly expect in the future. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, you know, what kind of vehicles those are, um, and what what, ad what adaptations you had to add to them to meet that standard? So we actually purchased buses that were had fully accessible washrooms, and I can certainly post or send to you, Terry, so that you're fully aware of that, because we, we do find that unique in the industry. And, um, you know, it, it's it's something that I feel is so important. We get so many you know stories and feedback from individuals that just feel so well supported. And uh, so it's something that's really important to us. So I'm happy to provide that information to you. That would, that would be very welcome, and I think that's that's mm -hmm. something that uh, other other operators around the country are going to need to need to follow suit and and to know that somebody's already done already done this is, is good, and that that, that is available. Um, so that's great. Um, okay, I'm just going to. I close. The conscious we're getting um, quite close to the, the top of the hour. Um, how how many more questions can I ask you? <laughs> <laughs> What time is it? <laughs> you know what? Honestly, I'm I'm happy to take any questions. It's always, these things are always so beneficial and valuable for us because it it like I said, it sort of breeds other questions and thoughts in people that will come through to us in surveys. And I, I did want to take the opportunity to thank all the people that have been advocating for it, but also that have been um, providing information as part of survey responses because all those things are looked at when we look at what users want, and so. These forums, I think, strike uh, other ideas that come forward so that we can make the service even better. So I'm happy to take some more questions. Okay, so uh, I have a question from uh, Mark Stanley, and he says, uh, "Yo, what do you know, can we use the existing infrastructure as a stop that?" He says, "Yeah, he clearly has rid ridden the train in in the past and said, you know, Cochrane to North Bay was survivable with, even with the old cars." So what what have you can you tell us what you've turned up so far in in looking at the infrastructure? So um, it's important to note that we don't have any of the Northlander cars. We used the Northlander cars and refurbished all of them with our skilled workforce in North Bay. And those are what the new consists for the Polar Bear Express are. So in terms of that, we do need to um, look outside to look for cars uh, across North America. And, and certainly we have a lot of irons in the fire there to, to see what's available. In terms of the track infrastructure, um, the track is extremely good. And, you know, I, I, I'd be remiss to not thank MTO and the province for the significant capital program that they've um, approved for us. We had a first time ever in our history a few years ago, had a 10 year capital plan approved and it includes um, significant amount of track infrastructure. So um, obviously there's a difference between running passenger and running freight, um, the difference of 20 miles per hour. But the good news is, is that we did run a test train. I was on it uh, in March and um, with some of the Polar Bear Express fleet on our track. And it was a phenomenal ride. Uh, it was exactly what I would have hoped for. It was what I imagined the service will look like. And the transit time was approximately the same as it was in 2012. So man, uh, you know, I couldn't be more proud of the infrastructure group that we have here that's taken that investment and, and done what they needed to do in the track so that we have uh, basically all that we need on the northern corridor now we'll be looking at a track audit on the the southern corridor under cn i mean the other good news just so everybody is aware and i think everybody is that um in the last decade uh, metrolinx has purchased additional track and they run farther north uh, than they did in 2012 so there there is a smaller gap in terms of the area that we're going to be looking for with CN to ensure that any congestion is mitigated by when we go through uh, their network to make sure that we're on time. Great, that's, that's, that's also good news, thank you. 
Um, somebody asks here, Michael Oliver asks, um, will sustainability and carbon reduction goals be included in the updated business case? You know what, that's a really good question. And one of the things as a whole that Ontario Northland is really uh, starting to integrate in all of our planning and to promote, it's not that we don't know it, we do know it, but we don't talk about it enough. And um, as everybody who's a rail fan on this call knows, uh, you know, traveling by rail and by bus is extremely environmentally friendly and incorporating uh, the impact of having passengers ride on rail and bus versus a car um, should and I hope will be involved in this updated business case. It's something that we all should be talking about. Um, and and I, I know that we're all environmentally uh, conscious, but I think we have to take it to the next level and really make that part of the conversation because it's so important. Okay, so um, another question here is uh, reg regarding connections in, in Simcoe, Simcoe County in the Barry and Aurelia area. In the initial business case, the, you know, the train stops at, Gorm at Gormley and then it, it goes through Wachego, it doesn't stop at Wachego, it goes, it goes straight through to, um, through, to, through to the Muskokas. Um, what's being looked at in terms of making the, the, those, con those connections um, in, in, in the near north? Wow. So that will be an integrated solution with our bus service because there's no, unfortunately, there's no um, tracks that that would connect. In fact, where they used to go years and years and years and years ago, um, you know, it's fully developed with a subdivision and Home Depot and a whole bunch of other things that go in through Barrie. So um, it will be where we'll go around the lake uh, on the east side, as we did with the Northlander, and we will fully integrate seamlessly with our bus network to service people from the train to Aurelia and Barrie and down to Toronto that way. Excellent. So I'm getting a couple of people who are also concerned that, um, of course, the, initial, the current provincial government did say that they hope to get the train running before the next election, and it doesn't look as though that they're going to, to meet that target. Um, how concerned are you that um, a change of provincial government would uh, would disrupt plans um, and the, the the updated business case? And to, to what to what extent have you been able to to talk to the the policy people or all the other political parties in Ontario to uh, to show them the excellent work that's been done on this? So you know, my personal opinion. I think people would share this is that all political parties now support passenger rail. And, um, you know, obviously we had thought earlier on that the timeline might be a little bit sooner, but the, the reality is the good news for me is, and that I, that I can say honestly to everybody else is um, I have never seen the amount of work and the amount of dedicated funds and the long-term planning for this solution since I've been in this chair as, as CEO. So there is so many people dedicated to this initial business case and now to the updated business case and the $5 million of really making sure that the updated business case provides the landscape for an implementation plan that um, I, really, I really think that this is going to progress to the next steps. Now, do I have the authority to say that? I don't, right? Our, our, our role and our mandate is to provide this information for decision-making and then MTO and, and government and the premier's office will make the final decision. But, um, you know, I, I also think that as a, as a country, we are recognizing the impact of passenger rail. And we're seeing this in my conversations with the CEO of VIA and, and her conversations with the federal government and integration with CN and CP and making sure that that train gets to the West with the right on-time performance. I think there's just been a little bit of a shift when we look at environmental, when we look at um, a lot of baby boomers and a new um, level of people that want to take passenger rail. I, I just think everything uh, is coming in at the same time that's positive for, for this initiative. That's great. And uh, talking about the federal government as well, Peter Myasic asks, um, what's the stage of the Polar Bear Express potentially qualifying for the federal remote subsidy program, which of course is also the program that um, ought to be funding, in our opinion, the, 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 the mass quality to ban. I'll go much right. Mm -hmm. um, so we continue to make inroad. Uh, well, we continue to follow up with the federal government to request funding. I 100% agree. I think um, absolutely the Polar Bear Express and the new uh, Northlander, updated Northlander, should receive federal funding. And especially the Polar Bear Express, that is an essential land link. It's the only 
transportation service connecting by 200 miles the First Nations communities of the James Bay Coast. Uh, it's a significant investment for us. Um, I continue to push uh, local representatives and that conversation forward. And certainly I, you know, I appreciate, there's a lot of people I know that are on this call today and other mayors that have put forward that to their representatives as well. Because let's, I mean, let's look at that landscape. If we were able to get the appropriate and deserved funding for the Polar Bear Express and or this new service, that would do one of two things. In my opinion, it would allow us to expand and to support the Northern region better with those dollars and or some of it could, could go back to government and be a savings. Um, now, when I look at the fact that, you know, Greyhound received funding and other uh, entities received funding from the federal government and we're, you know, solving those gaps with a current bus service and in the future with also potentially a passenger rail service, it deserves funding from the federal government. And um, I will continue to push that hard. And I hope that the people who are listening that have ties to the federal government or, can advocate for that, I hope they will do so. I know I see a, a bunch of people on here um, from Phnom and, and other communities uh, to Missing Shores and, and they've, they've supported that and they continue to take that message forward. And the more that we talk about that, I, I'm hopeful that that comes through. Now, now it is 12 o'clock. We don't wanna keep you on here all day, although um, we are really enjoying these answers. Um, a lot of people are saying, um, thank you very much and keep up the good work to, uh, to Ontario Northland. Thank you also the people who are thanking us at uh, Transport Action and, um, and Northeastern Ontario Rail Network. The one question I have is that people are, ask, are asking is, you know, what, what is the soonest that this, could, this, this process could play out? Um, thinking about the critical path for, for securing, securing equipment. Um, is, is 2024 too much to hope for? You know what, I can't rightfully answer because we, we haven't got that information back from all the potential providers of rail cars. So I would re be remiss in really stating something. I, you know, you have my word that, you know, here's what the process looks like that we can control. We can control the fact that we've been given this funding. It can include a very detailed implementation plan that will be delivered to government in March of 2022. And we will outline and know at that point um, what that potential implementation plan uh, milestones look like. So we'll know then, you know, how, how is the, you know, infrastructure with CN? Are there, is that a critical path item? Um, what are the passenger cars look like? Is there an intermediate solution and a long-term solution? Um, we are looking at everything to be able to, you know, fast track getting a service up and running. And so that's our job. We need to be able to say to government, if you want it, this quickly, this is what it looks like. And if you want it this quickly, this is what it looks like. And so we're gonna include all of that uh, in the plan and, and, and push forward. And, and you know what we're passionate about is just making sure that we bring everybody's um, perspectives and input forward. That's, that's what we take very seriously. And, and I just want to, I don't know if there's anybody here uh, from Ontario Northland on the call, but um, man, we have an outstanding workforce right now. And uh, these are passionate Northerners that know transportation like I've never seen. And the, the people we're attracting and, and the people that have been here for 35 years, you couldn't ask for a better group of people to look at this solution and put the best plan forward. So rest assured, I think it's in good hands and we'll do all we can to represent what, what your vision is as well. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Karina. Um, so on behalf of Transport Action and the uh, Northern and Eastern Ontario Rail Network, thank you everybody for joining the call this morning. Um, your support has brought us this far and with your continued support, we look forward to seeing the train return soon. If you haven't already become a member of Transport Action, please consider joining us and adding your voice to the efforts to restore sustainable and in public, inclusive public transport for Canadians from coast to coast or uh, making a donation through it through our Northern Ontario Fund to, to support this campaign. Once again, thank you everybody very, uh, very much. Thank you.